Hello everyone, welcome back to Virology Live. I'm Vincent Racaniello and today we're going to be talking about the infectious cycle. And before we start, I just want to point out that by popular demand you said pull the camera in closer, so I did. I can probably get it even closer, but this is good for now. You said it was too contrasty. I fixed the contrast. And this is a work in progress. Remember that. All right. The infectious cycle. What is the infectious cycle? It is what virologists like myself and many others divide uh, the whole cycle of reproduction in the cell into steps to facilitate how we study them. So the infectious cycle is everything that happens from the moment a virus particle attaches to the cell surface and goes into the cell, goes through all the steps needed to make new virus particles, and then the particles are released. That is the infectious cycle. Sometimes I will call it the reproduction cycle, all right? Infectious cycle, reproduction cycle. I will use the definitions interchangeably. I know I need a haircut. I'm getting one tomorrow. Chill. <laughs> the infectious cycle is today's topic. We're going to talk about what it is and how you study it. But before we do that, we need some definitions, as always, because virologists use words differently from everyone else. In fact, I use uh, words differently from everything else, too. So here we go. First of all, a susceptible cell. Now, this is all about cells and culture, okay? It's different for hosts, for, for animal hosts, plant hosts, whatever. Let's just focus for this uh, session on cells and culture. A susceptible cell, when Vincent says that, it means it has the receptor for a virus. That is all it means. All right, so here on the upper right are two scenarios. On the left, we have a susceptible. Well, they're both susceptible. This is a susceptible cell because it has the receptor. The one on the right is also a susceptible, susceptible cell. Uh, the one on the left apparently can support all the uh, reproduction steps. The one on the right can't. But it doesn't matter in terms of the definition susceptibility. Okay? Uh, all that matters is susceptible has a receptor. The cell may or may not have a receptor. All right? That's susceptible. Now, a resistant cell has no receptor. And again, on the right, we have the two cells here. We have... One cell, which can carry out reproduction, the other cannot. But it doesn't matter in terms of resistance. Resistance just has to do with the receptor on the cell surface. A little bit counterintuitive, maybe. And finally, a permissive cell has the capacity to replicate a virus. Here we go on the right. We have two cells, which are both permissive. Everything beyond the receptor can happen. Uh, and, you know, the one on the left is not susceptible, the one on the right is susceptible, but they're both permissive. Permissivity has to do with beyond receptor. And so, taking all of these, you can now deduce that a susceptible and permissive cell is the only cell that can take up a virus particle and reproduce it. I tend to use replicate to mean nucleic acid, but that's fine. All right, susceptible and permissive, the virus will attach, it will get into the cell, it will go through all the steps to make new virus particles. That is what a susceptible and permissive cell is, okay? So not everyone uses these words. Even virologists do not use these terms the way that I do. Uh, I happen to have written a virology text, and, um, I, I, you know, the, the, the definitions in the first chapter have to be the same as in the second chapter. So this is what I use, and this is what I will use throughout this course. Susceptible, permissive, resistant, and the one that the virus attaches to and then goes through the whole cycle is susceptible and permissive. Now, last time when we 
discuss the discovery of viruses, that was at an era where we could not propagate virus in the laboratory in cultured cells. There were no cultured cells. There were just animals and plants, right? So for the many years, for the first many years of after their discovery, I would say until the 30s, 40s, and even 50s, uh, we couldn't grow viruses and or propagate them in cultured cells. And so we had to uh, propagate viruses in laboratory animals. All kinds of laboratory animals were used, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and it was only much later that uh, we learned to use cells. And, and, and you know, the problem with growing viruses in laboratory animals, besides it's not easy, is that you can end up selecting for viruses that are really good at growing in the animal, but maybe less so in humans. So that was a real problem. One of the laboratory animals that was used and is still used to this day is uh, the embryonated chicken egg, which is shown here. This, is, this was used for many years for different viruses. So you can see on the right here all the different kinds of viruses that we used to propagate in uh, embryonated chicken egg. So an embryonated chicken egg means it's been fertilized. It has a little embryo in it. This is not the kind you buy uh, at the grocery store. It's, you, those should not be embryonated, right? <laughs> You just want the egg uh, with the the uh, yo the yolk sac and the uh, allantoic fluid, but uh, it's an embryonated egg that is used for virology because when it's embryonated, you get different kinds of um, of tissues in the egg, and so here in this egg we have, of course, at one end an air sac, we have a um, chorio allantoic membrane. We have an allantoic cavity in blue. That's where there's the, the biggest volume of fluid is in the allantoic cavity. There's a bit of albumin there to nourish the embryo. Uh, the yolk sac, of course, and then we have the amniotic cavity, which surrounds the embryo, and then there's amniotic fluid in there. And, and viruses are inoculated into different places, as you can see in this slide, chorioallantoic membrane. You can go right into the amniotic cavity. You can go into the yolk sac. You can go into the allantoic cavity. And, and I used to use these for uh, influenza virus, which you inoculate uh, typically into the allantoic cavity. It re the virus reproduces in the cells that line the cavity, and you get a very nice yield of virus. Now, we don't use these anymore, except for influenza viruses, uh, because we have cells in culture. For influenza viruses, we still use this to make vaccines, as we'll talk about later, which you can see in this slide, uh, just as a preview of uh, influenza virus vaccine production. Uh, many influenza virus vaccines are grown in embryonated chicken and eggs. It's uh, inoculated into the egg in, in an automated process. It's put in racks, incubated, and then harvested. We'll, we'll talk more about these later. A, a really, really important event in virology took place in 1949 when John Enders and his two colleagues, Weller and Robbins, were working up at Harvard found out that you could grow poliovirus or propagate poliovirus in human cell cultures. And they used primary cultures of embryon embryonic tissues that they obtained from the hospital. They plated them out in cultures and they found that poliovirus could grow in it. This was the first time that anyone had figured that out in 1949. Uh, you can see John Enders got on the cover of Time magazine. I think that was the early 1960s. Uh, and uh, this was a key discovery in virology in general. Of course, for poliovirus, it was key because it allowed us to start working on vaccines in a, in a meaningful way. Now, uh, these cells were not used to make the vaccines, but the technology was the, the vaccines, the polio vaccines were grown in cells produced from uh, non-human primate kidneys. So these individuals received the Nobel Prize uh, in 1954 for this discovery. And... Um, Really, uh, this prize covers all vaccines that are propagated in cell culture. That's why no vaccine, except for the yellow fever vaccine, ever got a Nobel Prize uh, because th this is the one that's considered to cover all that. Whether you know the mRNA vaccines get a Nobel or not, we'll see. Uh, today, the medicine prize was announced, and it had nothing to do with mRNA, but it could be another Nobel Prize. So today, we propagate viruses and different kinds of cells and culture. They grow on 
plastic surfaces in dishes or flasks, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, they grow in, in flat sheets that we call monolayers. And there are different kinds of cell cultures. That is, three of them are shown here. So on the left, we have primary human foreskin fibroblasts. Foreskin, as you know, is taken from many males throughout the world in hospitals. And so that tissue is thrown away. And if you want it, you can get it. You, you file the proper paperwork and you can get the foreskin. Then you can uh, chop it up and digest it to make single cells. And then you plate them out on the plastic. So the process of putting the cells on the, place, on the plastic, I call plating out. You, put, you cover the cells with medium and they will grow. And they can be infected with many viruses. And this is a, a very nice culture system. It's human. Of course, it is the foreskin. So, you know, the relevance to most virus infections is, is low. However, many viruses do reproduce in them. The only uh, one of the advantages is that they are human cells. And one of the disadvantages, of course, is that um, they don't live forever. They only divide about... 20 or 30 times, and then they die. They have a finite lifespan. The reason for that we're going to talk about later in this course. And so cell lines have been developed that are immortal. They grow forever. Here is a mouse fibroblast cell line, a very famous one called 3T3 cells. Uh, these are the famous uh, HeLa cells, of course. HeLa cells, which is an immortal human cell line. Uh, these are called con either immortal lines or continuous cell lines. They, they do grow uh, in monolayers. They have very different properties from the primary cells because they're transformed. They're basically cancer cells. They grow forever. They have differences from normal cells. Uh, but the advantages are that you can uh, keep growing them forever. You freeze them down. You can recover them and so forth. However, they are chromosomally very abnormal. You know, he, human HeLa cells have many, many copies of each chromosome. And so if that matters for your virus, there are alternatives. For example, we have diploid cell strains, uh, which um, have the right number of human chromosomes. An example is WI38 uh, and, and human embryonic lung cells and so forth. But if you need more normal cells, you can use those. Those grow longer. They're not immortal. They will grow much longer than primary cells. And uh, they can be used for vaccine production, whereas the, the transformed cells in general cannot be because they're transformed in their cancer cells. So here is an example of uh, how you grow these cells. These are photographs from my laboratory. So here is an incubator. It's not where I am now. I am at the incubator, but my incubator is named after this incubator. It maintains the cells at 37 degrees Celsius. It also keeps an atmosphere of 5% carbon dioxide, which is uh, needed for the buffering system as the cells grow. They, they produce lactic acid, of course, and that would acidify the medium dangerously. So we buffer it, and part of the buffering system, there's a bicarbonate-based buffer in the medium, but in the atmosphere of the incubator uh, is 5% carbon dioxide. And I often mention on my Q&A with A and V that I have to go in and change the CO2 tanks. This is why. So we have big plates. We have uh, six centimeter plates here. In the front six centimeter, we have a 10 centimeter. We have six well plates where there are six individual wells. We have flasks of different sizes. These are all produced by the petroleum industry as a byproduct, right? It's plastics. Um, and these are cells in culture, the various types in which we grow our viruses. Now, I notice that Les has just said, is there an immune system here? There is an innate immune system, but there is not an adaptive immune system here. No, absolutely not. You would have to grow immune cells in culture if you wanted to do that. On the right is what we call a spinner flask. If you need large quantities of viruses, you can grow them in suspension. So what we, what we have here is we have a... Uh, a bottle with a, a magnet in it which spins on a glass rod. And on the bottom here, this is sitting on a, on a motorized magnet, basically. It's, a, it's called a stir plate. Inside of it is a motor spinning a magnet, which by induction spins the, the magnet in the spinner flask, and it spins it. So you can grow lots and lots of cells in suspension. We, we do this for HeLa cells. Not many cells can be grown that way. Of course, the HeLa cells are... Um, a, a very famous cell line. They were taken from uh, this 
young lady, Henrietta Lacks, in the 1950s. She developed cervical cancer. Uh, she was living in Maryland, went to Johns Hopkins. They took a piece of it out, and from that came HeLa cells, the first ever immortal human cell line. And, of course, um, she went on to die, and her family never knew that they took cells because that wasn't part of medical requirements back then. Uh, and then her f these cells turned out to be incredibly useful all through throughout laboratories all over the world. And her family found out about it many years later, and they freaked out. And the story of that, of course, is written by Rebecca Skloot in her book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, where um, the, the H-E in L-A, right? That's where HeLa cell came from, the first two letters of her first and last name. And I helped uh, Rebecca with some aspects of the book. You'll find me and Twiv mentioned a couple of times in the book if you've read it. Today we have even more amazing um, advances in cell culture. We can do things just way beyond just growing cells in a monolayer on a plastic dish. Plastic dish, For example, we can do, make what are called organoid cultures. They're, they're little mini organs that represent, for example, stomach, the lung, the intestine, the liver, etc. And they do not have immune systems, so this is a drawback, but they do sort of have architecture that represents the organ. They have the different cell types. And these are made from stem cells. And you can induce stem cells to become organoids using different chemicals. You can make them into different organoids. So here, these are two ways that you can make a stem cell. Of course, you can take a blastocyst, right, an early stage embryo, uh, with all these cells in the inner cell mass. You take them out and those are called embryonic stem cells. They will become anything you want if you just have to treat them in the right way. Uh, but this, of course, requires an embryo. Uh, there are some embryonic human embryonic cell lines that you can work with, but uh, you know, for, for many years this was prohibited to get fresh uh, embryonic stem cells, and you could only use uh, embryonic s stem cell lines. Or you can take any somatic cell. What is a somatic cell? Well, it's any cell that you can see uh, on your skin, your, your, the mouth, the respiratory epithelium, anything but your germline, right? Sperm and egg or germline, somatic cells, everything else. And you can take a somatic cell, like a skin cell, uh, and you can make it a stem cell by adding a couple of different genes or mRNAs. It becomes an induced pluripotent stem cell, which you can then... Um, differentiate into an organoid. So anyway, you can take these organoids and make different si kinds of cell cultures uh, and infect them with different viruses. Uh, then we, we have another one on the right here called an air-liquid interface culture, which is really wonderful. You, th This is used to approximate the respiratory tract. So uh, if you want to do experiments with viruses that infect the respiratory tract, you really should make an air liquid interface culture, not use a kidney cell line, for example, which has done a lot for SARS-CoV-2 these days. So here you take a bit of respiratory epithelium. Many people, for example, have biopsies because they snore, right, and they have pieces of their respiratory tract taken out, and you can get those and make them into single cells, and then you plate them on a membrane in a tissue culture dish shown here. So this is a cell culture dish, and we have medium in it. There's a membrane suspended from the sides. It's permeable. And you plate the cells on that membrane, you add medium, and then the cells will grow, and eventually they make a monolayer. They fill up the membrane, right? And then when they're a good monolayer, you take off the medium from the top. You leave the medium on the bottom to feed the cells. You take the medium off the top, and the cells are now in the air, which... They, they find their right place in the world. <laughs> That's what they were meant to be, right, in the air, because your respiratory tract is exposed to the air. And then they differentiate into all the different cell types that make up the respiratory epithelium, including mucus-producing cells, ciliated epithelial cells. And so this is a beautiful model for studying viruses that infect uh, the in, in respiratory tract. So what are these used for? Have to, you want to study virus replication. You want to study the different steps. You want to identify antiviral drugs. You need to do all of that in cell culture. 
You can't just look at the virus and find out about it. All right, so let's take a quiz. Uh, let's, um, let's go to Socrative. Let's, uh, let me bring me in here so you can see a human for a bit. Now, you're going to go to Socrative.com, log in, student. The room number is virus. And I will go to Socrative now. And um, ooh, I, I didn't log in, eh? There we go. Quiz. Would you like to stop? No, I don't want to stop the current activity. There should be a quiz running here. Hmm? Here we go. Lecture two, the infectious cycle. You already found it before me. Let's make this uh, full screen here. All right, a blank and blank cell is the only cell that can take up a virus particle and replicate it. Fill in the blanks. A, naive and resistant. B, primary and permissive. C, susceptible and permissive. D, susceptible and naive. E, continuous and immortal. So you should be able to see that on your uh, own screen there your phone or tablet or laptop. And in the meantime, let's see if we have any um, questions uh, related to what we've said so far. Yeah, here we go. Fred has a great question. Why would you ever use kidney cells for SARS-CoV-2? Well, that's in fact what was done early on because it grew in them. Right, you, you, you need a cell to grow the virus. You don't know what it's going to grow in. So you take some common cell lines. We know that coronaviruses grow in kidney cells. And so that's what a lot of people use from vervet monkeys called Vero cells. And it's fine to grow virus, but to study the reproduction cycle is not good for reasons that we'll, we'll actually address in this lecture. So you have to be very careful about picking your cell line. And if you're not a virologist, you don't know that. And a lot of people flooded into COVID who were not virologists and they didn't realize that using Vero cells was not the right thing to do. Very unfortunate. Let's see if we have any other questions here. I'm glad that the sound is good. I am glad that um, you, you like the uh, image very good. And here's Les's question from before. Do, do the cell cultures have an immune system? And that's an important question. They have innate immunity. They have interferon. They have the sensors for interferon, which we will talk about later. But they do not have antibodies in T cells. So that's absent. And organoids don't either. People are trying to figure out how to add immune systems to organoids, but right now they don't. So it's a shortcoming for sure. All right, we have here, uh, we've got 93 students, and more will, will come, but we'll, let's uh, take this, uh, show the results right now. What do we have? So most of you've got the right answer, which is C, susceptible and a susceptible and permissive cell is the only cell that can take up a virus particle and replicate it. That was very clear in that first slide I showed, right? Um, some of you picked naive and resistant. No, I didn't use those words at all. The resistant I did, but naive part is not right. Susceptible and naive. So I use susceptible, but naive, no. Continuous and immortal. That's a kind of cell line, but the only cell that can take up a virus particle and replicate it is a susceptible and permissive one. Continuous and immortal may or may not be susceptible and permissive, right? Okay, so that's the story there. Let's, um, I'm looking at the questions here. Anyway, that's good. 98% is good. Uh, vanity Nutrition will recall in class, uh, when, I, when, when the class got the first 100%, I was very happy. Um, some classes it takes longer than others. <laughs> All right, let's go back to slides. <clears throat> and let's get rid of uh, Vidi here. Okay, now we've got cells in culture, so we can put our virus on them. And you may say, how do you do that? Well, the cells in the dishes, right, are 
growing, let's go back to our dishes, right? The cells in the dishes, they have, they have liquid on top of them. And so you take these dishes, you bring them into the cell culture hood, you aspirate off the liquid, you, you have a little contraption with a vacuum and a, and, a, and a pipette, you aspirate off the liquid, and now you have your cells exposed to the air, you put the virus on top of them, you put a small volume of virus, and you can infect your cells. And so the question then is, how do you know uh, when your cells are infected. And one of the ways is by what we call cytopathic effect or CPE. Very important con concept, right? CPE, cytopathic effect. What that means is the changes that the virus causes to the infected cell. And this is a series of photographs uh, taken under a microscope of uh, cells infected with poliovirus. And uh, here on the upper left is the uninfected cell model. Very nice monolayer, right? Cells are all uh, looking lovely, touching each other, healthy looking. And then uh, four hours later, after poliovirus infection, you can see now there are some round cells that are present, more so than at, uh, the uninfected cell. And those round cells are a consequence of virus infection. So one of the effects of infection, that the cells start to round up. They lose that nice... Uh, cell shape. And then eight hours later, most of them are now uh, rounded up. No more of those cells sitting on the plastic. And then by 12 hours, they're all, they're all pretty much broken. So rounding up, detachment, breaking, those are all different kinds of cytopathic effect. We can see that our cells uh, are infected. Now, I want to show you how this kind of an assay was used to identify SARS-CoV-2. In fact, when I was teaching this course in uh, January of 2020, uh, this paper came out as a preprint, and it was the, the day after we just did this lecture. And so I was very excited to show people how you can use cytopathic effect to identify a virus. So here is the, uh, the Nature article, a pneumonia outbreak associated with a new coronavirus of probable bat origin. This is from Zhang Li Shi's laboratory in Wuhan, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And they, they note here, here we report the identification and characterization of a new coronavirus. And remember, the first name was 2019 novel coronavirus, which was then changed to SARS-CoV-2, which caused an epidemic of acute respiratory syndrome in humans in Wuhan. So let's see what they did in this paper. So this is the figure. This is actually from the preprint, the bioarchive preprint, before it got published in Nature. We successfully isolated the virus. So what they did is they took bronchoalveolar bronco lavage. They had patients with atypical pneumonia who didn't seem to be infected with any other virus that they looked at. You, they put a tube down into their trachea. They squirt a little PBS down there. They pull it out. So it's basically washing the, the respiratory lining. And uh, if there's virus there, they're going to pull it out. Uh, and then they put the virus on Vero cells. Okay, here's a, a monolayer of Vero cells on the left, and it, there's not a lot of contrast here, but you can see the cells. It's just a, a, a light pho photomicrograph. And they use Vero and also a human liver cell line, but these are the Vero's. And you may ask why. Well, they tried cells that they had in the lab that they knew might be susceptible to a coronavirus. They probably had some idea already. Uh, and... Um, you can see here, um, they, they say we infected the cells using BALF samples from one patient. Clear cytopathogenic effects were observed after three days. So this is day zero, this is day three. You can really see the cytopathic effect. They call it cytopathogenic, that's fine. We call it cytopathic. The cells have rounded up, and there are big holes in the monolayer where they have detached. So there you go. And can you imagine when they came into the lab that morning and saw this, how excited they were? In a, in a way, well, they got a virus, right? So that's how you can use CPE. Now, not every virus will do that. Not every virus will cause CPE. So they were lucky, and uh, they took it from there. Now, another kind of cytopathic effect is what we call formation of syncytia. This is maybe a word you've not heard of before. Syncytia is a name for fused cells. 
by the way, B-A-L-F, someone is asking, bronco alveolar lavage fluid. I did mention it before. Since this happens when cells are fused, infected cells fuse with one another. So here is a culture of cells infected with a virus that we know causes syncytia. Uh, many kinds of viruses do that. Coronaviruses do that. So do uh, paramyxoviruses, of which measles is a member. So here are the individual cells. And then you can see where the arrow is. There's one giant cell with many nuclei in it, which has been formed as the infected cells fuse. And the process of fusion or syncytia formation is shown uh, on, the, on the right here. Here we have two infected cells. Now the key here is that when envelope viruses, that is viruses with a membrane, when they infect cells, the spike protein that's going to end up in the virus particle is displayed on the plasma membrane of the cell. And that's shown in red here as a Y-shaped molecule. So this cell is infected, and it's uh, yet to make virus particles. But those spikes are on the surface, and those spikes can bind to receptors on a neighboring cell. And one of the things that happens when a spike binds a receptor is it can catalyze fusion of the two membranes, because if this were a virus particle, that would be fusion of virus with cell. But it's two cells. The two cells fuse. And now we have one cell with two nuclei, and eventually the many, many cells will, will do that. And uh, you have uh, many nuclei. And yeah, if these are all infected cells, so this, this one at the top here doesn't have to be an infected cell. The only, you only need one of the pair to be an infected cell for this fusion to occur. But you could have multiple infected cells fuse as well. So that's syncytium formation. So there's, it's a couple of different kinds of cytopathic effects. Uh, is um, we've talked about so far, and here are more examples of cytopathic effects. And you know, you don't need to memorize any of these. And I tell my students, don't memorize this. I just want you to see the variety of cytopathic effects that we have observed over the years with different viruses. So we have looked at uh, syncytium formation, paramyxoviruses, and coronaviruses, uh, rounding up and detachment of cultured cells. Right? We we talked about that for poliovirus, which is a picornavirus. There are many other kinds of cytopathic effects, you know, alterations in the nucleus, uh, inclusion bodies, that is, things in the cell that are not supposed to be there. And they are typically where viruses are being assembled. And when they were first discovered, they were usually named by the person who discovered them. And here we have Negri bodies, a typical in rabies virus infected cell. Negri was an Italian pathologist. So was Guarnieri, <laughs> who named Quarnary bodies, the factories in the cytoplasm of cells infected with pox viruses. So many different kinds of cytopathic effects, and this can help you tell tell you if uh, your cell is infected. All right, now the next question is: If you've grown your virus, you want to know how many viruses you have. Uh, you know, you may know that there's going to be a virus there by the cytopathic effect, but sometimes you don't. So we asked the question, how many viruses are in our samples? And we have multiple ways of figuring this out. We can measure infectivity, and we will talk about that for sure. Uh, or you can measure, you can do physical assays for virus particles or their components. Now, the infectivity assays are the ones that actually measure infectious virus. Everything else does not, and that's an important distinction that we'll actually talk about later. But, but uh, this, by the way, is a photo of Amy's uh, bench <laughs> in the laboratory. And um, these are all little, little tubes containing samples of virus. Here's some stained plaque assay plates. Um, yeah, this, this is a lovely photo, I thought. And, you know, you label the tops of these, these individual tubes so you know what's in them. All right, let's talk about measuring infectivity. First assay for that is called the plaque assay. You'll understand in a moment why we call it a plaque assay. This was first developed in the 1930s to study bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria. They won't, the scientists studying these wanted to do quantitative measurements of bacteriophage reproduction in cells, so they needed to develop an assay that could measure infectivity, and this is what they came up with. This uh, is a Petri dish. It's photographed from the bottom. And on it is a lawn of bacteria. A lawn simply means 
that the surface of the agar, you know, we're looking from the bottom here, but the surface of the agar is covered with a thin layer of bacteria. You can actually see it's kind of opaque. Uh, those are billions and billions of bacteria. And then what we see here are clearings in the bacterial lawn, each of which is caused by a single virus starting an infection, which then proceeds until it's a circle. And the virus is killing the bacteria, so you have a clearing. And each of these clearings is a plaque, and you can count them and, and measure the titer of your virus in plaque-forming units per milliliter. All right, so that's the plaque assay. We're going to explore how that's done in, in a few moments. But in 1952, a, an Italian scientist working in uh, California at Caltech, Renato Dulbecco, he adapted that plaque assay uh, for use with animal viruses. Uh, and he, he here's one of the plaque assay plates from his paper. And this was his paper where he published this in uh, 1952, production of plaques in monolayer tissue cultures by single particles of an animal virus. And um, so this was the plaque assay procedure now that we all use uh, to study animal viruses. And, and this, this single particles, we're going to talk about how he knew that in a moment. But first, let's talk about the plaque assay. How do you do a plaque assay? So you have a tube of viruses, right? One of those tubes on Amy's desk. And I say, Amy, how much virus is here? And so what Amy will do is take that tube of virus and do a plaque assay. And the first thing you do is make a series of dilutions. And it's very simple. So Amy will set up a bunch of tubes with 0.9 mLs of, say, phosphate buffered saline, which I'll often refer to as PBS or even cell culture medium. It doesn't matter, 0.9 ml. And then she will take 0.1 ml of the virus stock and she will put it into the first tube and mix it up. And that is now a 1 to 10 dilution, right? Or what we call in, in science 10 to the minus 1. She then takes 0.1 mls of that, puts it in the next tube, mixes it up, and so on and so forth. And of course, all these tubes are labeled. Otherwise, you will be hopelessly lost. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not labeled in the picture here. Uh, but then eventually, you're getting, these are tenfold serial dilutions, one after another. And you, here we're going out to 10 to the minus seventh. And then you take 0.1 ml of some of these dilutions. You don't need to do all of them unless you have no idea how well your virus is growing. And then you could take all of them. But if this is safe for poliovirus, we know how well it's going to grow. So we can take just three of these last dilutions. We can put 0.1 ml onto our cells growing in dishes. We've taken off the medium, right? And we put 0.1 ml on. We let the virus stick to the cells for about 45 minutes. We put these back in the incubator. Of course, they have a lid over them when we put them back in the incubator. And then after 45 minutes, we take the, the plates out. We cover them with an overlay, a medium overlay, but it's not liquid. It has agar in it. So it's put on as a liquid at, at a, you know, 40 degrees Celsius. And then it will solidify at room temperature within a few minutes. And we put it back in the incubator. We let it incubate for a few days. Uh, and then we take off the monolayer. We stain the cells and we can count the plaques that have resulted. And these are holes in the monolayer caused by virus infection of the cells. We'll explore in a minute how those holes form. And you can count the plaques and determine the titer of infectious virus in terms of plaque forming units per milliliter or PFU per mil. And so here, you know, we have a lot of plaques on this plate, which is made from the 10 to the minus 5 dilution. Here we have a good countable number, you know, between 10 and, and, and 100 or so. And here there are too few in the highest dilution to be reproducible. So we pick this dilution. There are 17 plaques here. And then we can calculate the titer. And then the titer is calculated. Well, you take this dilution. We remove the minus sign. We have 10 to the 6. We have another tenfold dilution here, right? Because we're only plating 0.1 ml. It's very important. A lot of people miss that. So the final dilution is 10 to the minus 7th. So to express the titer, we say this is 17 uh, times 10 to the 7th. PFU per mil, or we can move the decimal point over one to the left, 
and then we add a number to the exponent, and now we have 1.7 times 10 to the eighth PFU per mil. All right, so either 17 times 10 to the seventh or 1.7 times 10 to the eighth. That's the same number, and that's the titer of the virus in plaque forming units per mil. And remember to take always into account that you're plating at only 0.1 mL. This will be on the exam, and many of you will forget to do that. And many of you will forget to take off the minus sign. You don't want to have the negative sign in the final dilution because the negative sign is the dilution, but now you're expressing the titer in PFU per mil. So again, uh, the, uh, the cells are growing on the plastic. You put agar on top of them. And the, the function of the agar, very important, is to restrict virus diffusion in the medium. If you put liquid on top, when this virus came out of cells, it would simply spread to all the cells in the monolayer and infect them all, and you would never get plaque. So the agar's function is to restrict the virus diffusion, so now you can get a plaque. And so here is a, a diagram of a plaque. So on the upper left is our plaque assay plate, and the thick agar overlay you can see on top of the cells. And what you have done is you have put very few viruses on. So here we have infection of a single cell by one virus particle. How we know that? I'll I'll tell you in a moment. And that cell has died now. It's released virus, and those viruses have spread to the neighboring cells. And their spread, again, is restricted because of the agar overlay. Really important. And so now the hole in the monolayer gets bigger and bigger as more and more cells are infected until you can see it with the naked eye. You stain it, you stain the cells, and then the, the cells will stain purple. Wherever there are no cells, there'll be a hole, and you see a plaque. Uh, here is a microscopic view of a plaque. Here uh, is the surrounding healthy cells, and here you can see the cells have died and detached. And when you take the agar overlay off and you stain it, these cells all wash away, so you get a hole in the monolayer. Now, not all viruses form plaques, uh, as you may guess. And so in some cases, we need to do tricks to see a plaque. Here on the right is a plaque of a herpes virus. The herpes, This particular herpes virus doesn't form plaques, but... If you put the gene encoding a dye in the viral genome, you can then stain the, the plaques and count them as you would. So, so you're not seeing any cell death, yet you're still able to do a plaque assay. Now here's a movie of plaque formation. This, in my opinion, is the greatest movie ever made. Let's, um, let's stop it and I'll explain what was done here. So this is a monolayer of cells that was infected with a vaccinia virus. Uh, a laboratory version of a smallpox virus that's safe to work with. And the, the uh, scientists let the plaque assay run for a while, and then they looked at it under the microscope, and they identified what looked like the beginning of a plaque right here in the middle. And then they focused their camera on it and did time-lapse photography. So they take a frame every so many seconds. And in the upper left, you're going to see the lapsing of time. And you can see the development of the plaque. So let's make it go. And you can see, I think this goes up to 17 hours or so, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15 hours. And you see the cells are dying. The circle is getting bigger and bigger. And that's going to be the plaque. Isn't that gorgeous? Isn't that gorgeous? This is like dropping a stone into a pond and the ripple goes out. Now, the cells are slowly changing the way they refract the light as they die. You can see that. That's that's one of the features of cytopathic effects. And the circle of cell death is getting bigger and bigger. Remember, there's an agar overlay on this collection of cells. So that is how a plaque forms. Yes, a plaque is a collection of dead cells. You can see them in the middle. When you take the agar overlay off, they tend to detach with the agar. So that's why you have a clearing in the plate. Now, we do lots of plaque assays. And this is the wall of polio, which is in my office at... Uh, Columbia University, uh, and um, maybe someday I will move it here to the incubator, <laughs> but um, I built this years ago. Uh, these are six well plates of a single experiment done by a postdoc, and they're all plaque assays of poliovirus, 1,600 six well plates, and um, I used to hold office hours in my office there, and students would come in, and in fact, this is the last time this photo was taken in the last version of this course that was done in person at Columbia. The spring of 2019 was the last time I taught the course in person. Uh, and these are some of the students who came for the last 
office hours before the final exam, and they um, wanted their picture in front of the wall of polio. So they got it. And we will resume teaching in the spring, and hopefully they can come back. Uh, although now everyone does office hours on Zoom, so uh, I don't know if we'll do that anymore. All right, let's go to our next quiz. Now, the next one is, when doing a plaque assay, what's the purpose of adding a semi-solid agar overlay on the monolayer of cells? A, to stabilize progeny virus particles. B, to ensure that the cells remain susceptible and permissive. C, to act as a pH indicator. D, to keep cells adherent to the plate during incubation. E, to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. All right, you sort that out, and I will go back to some questions here, some of which I have um, already answers, answered. All right, here we go. Do you grow, how do you grow mammalian cells on agar? You don't grow them on agar. They're growing on the plastic dish under liquid. You take the liquid off and you put agar on top. The agar is a mixture of agar, which is a carbohydrate mixture made from algae uh, and medium, the cell culture medium that the, that the cells need to grow on. So the cells are still on the plastic bottom here. No, the math is not really hard there. That's very simple math. I'm not a great mathematician myself, so if I can do it, you can do it too. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so what's in agar? A-G-A-R. So you can get different kinds of agar, all different kinds. The simplest is a crude preparation from algae. It's just an extract, mostly carbohydrates. It's semi-clear, but you can get highly purified ag agar, so carbohydrates of various sorts. And sometimes if your virus doesn't make a plaque, you change the agar, and it will perhaps at a different kind of agar. What causes or prevents the cascade of infection? Well, the cascade is when a cell breaks and releases viruses, then those diffuse to the neighboring cells. It's not very far, so they can diffuse to the next cells. Then they infect them. Those infect more, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Think of infecting more and more, and each one is a round of infection. So yes, a plaque is a collection of dead cells. And you can see it because when you take the agar off and you stain the monolayer, uh, you can see the difference. I'll show you a stained monolayer in a moment. I, I hope you understand the agar is on top of the cells. If it were liquid, the virus would come out of the cells and diffuse throughout the entire plate, right? Because it's liquid. Agar restricts the diffusion <laughs> of the virus particles. Is the agar play, uh, uh, providing food for the virus? It contain, It's mixed in with it. The agar itself is not food for the virus, but it mixed in with the agar is food for the cells to grow, and in turn the viruses grow uh, on the cells. Yeah, agar is like jello. It's, it's wiggly, yeah, <laughs> semi-solid. Let's see. How are the plates inoculated? You remove the liquid over the cells and you pipette 0.1 mLs of virus onto the cells. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> okay. So you seem to have a problem with the... Uh, the link, but there should be no problem. I see it here. Uh, let's see. We Why choose chimp kidney as a... Uh, no, th there's no chimp kidney here. I'm talking about not, uh, vervet monkey kidney cells or the cells that were used for the SARS-CoV-2 isolation. There's no chimp involved there. Uh, and uh, agar is the overlay in, of the cells that we're using to do the plaque assay. I don't know why you're having trouble with the quiz. I've got 89 people who have answered, although it seems to have stopped there.
Don't know why. Let's see, 90. So another person uh, answered. Okay. Let's see what we got here. We'll move on. All right. So most of you got the right answer, which is E. The purpose of the agar, which I, I kind of gave away while I was talking about it here, is to restrict viral diffusion. Okay, some of you said to stabilize progeny. No, it doesn't stabilize virus particles. It doesn't ensure the cells remain susceptible and permissive. They are inherently susceptible and permissive. Um, it doesn't act as a pH indicator. Good, none of you got that. To keep cells adhering to the plate. No, they're stuck to the plastic. The cells are stuck. You don't need the agar for that. They will remain adhered even under a liquid overlay. What's the key here is that... Um, you restrict diffusion of the virus. So if you had a liquid overlay, think about it. You had a liquid overlay when the viruses came out of that first cell. They would just spread throughout the liquid eventually. It would take some time, but eventually they would spread because there's a little bit of vibration or Brownian motion is going to do it. But an agar overlay will restrict the virus to only above that uh, initially infected cell, and that's why you get uh, the plaque. Okay, So um, that's that. Let's get back to... slides here and we will get rid of Vinny all right so by the way this is a beautiful plaque assay which I did years ago this happens to be influenza virus and these are three different dilutions right going from lower to higher the lower dilutions more plaques the one you would count here would be the middle one not enough on the lowest uh, on the highest dilution here so this shows you how you stain the cells with a dye that stains the living cells. So the living cells here are purple. This is crystal violet. We, this is what we use to stain our plaque assays. And then where the cells have cleared because the virus has killed them, you have the clearing, which is the plaque that you can count. Okay. Now, if how do, how do you know how many viruses are needed to form a plaque? Let's figure that out. Because remember, Dobeko in his paper said single viruses can form a plaque. Well, that's an easy experiment to do, actually. Uh, yes. Uh, Roe said this looks like a polyomavirus. Yep, you are absolutely right. I'm glad you uh, picked that up. That's the, the I made that image, too, uh, on the computer. All right, so it's very easy to figure out how many viruses are needed to form a plaque. You do a dose-response curve. And don't get upset about those response. All it is, you add more of something and you see what happens. You know, you could do that yourself. You could um, eat more of something and see what happens, right? What we do here is we give more viruses to the cells and we see how many plaques we get. So we are here increasing the amount of virus from left to right on the x-axis here. You know, the fancy name is relative virus concentration. More virus. 0.25 is less than 1, and we're counting the number of plaques. So we make dilutions, and we make a, do a plaque assay for each one. This is a really simple experiment, and this is what Dobeko did. And he found that for the viruses he was working with, whenever he doubled the amount of virus he added, he got double the amount of plaques. So here, when he went from 0.25 to 0.5, he, got, he went from 6 plaques to 12 plaques. And then if he doubled it again, he doubled it again up, up to here. So that tells you you need one virus to make a plaque. Why is that? Well, this is what we call one-hit kinetics. The number of plaques is proportional to the first power of the concentration of the virus inoculated. That's the mathematical way of describing it. You don't have to remember that. Basically, if the concentration of the virus is doubled, the number of plaques also doubles. So one virus is enough to form a plaque, and in that paper, he actually did this experiment to show that. Now, um, if for some viruses, actually, you need more than one virus to form a plaque, and many plant viruses actually package their genome in multiple particles, in pieces. So one piece will be in one particle, and one piece will be in another, and they both have to infect so that would be two-hit kinetics. The number of plaques is proportional to the square of the concentration. So you get a curve that tells you that two 
viruses are needed. But for most of the viruses in this course, we're going to talk about one hit kinetics. One virus is, is uh, enough to form a plaque. We use plaque assays so that, to purify viruses. So you can take your plate with plaques on it, and you, before you take the agar overlay off, you can actually see the plaques. You hold the plate up to the light, and you can see faintly the, um, the cell killing, and you can circle the plaque with a magic marker, and then you can turn it back over in your cell culture hood. You can plunge a pipette into the plaque and pull out a piece of agar, and that agar will have virus in it. And now you can add that plug to a tube of, of medium and do another plaque assay. We used to do this three times. We would call it thrice plaque purified to make a virus stock. And that's just to be sure that you're working with a purified stock of virus, so not a mixed stock. So for example, if I took a, a respiratory swab from your nose and put it in cells and culture and grew up virus and then plaqued it, I could have more than one virus. So you just make sure by multiply plaque purifying that you only have one. Not all viruses uh, form plaques. Um, sometimes uh, you have to do other things. And one of the things we can do is what's called an endpoint dilution assay. So here uh, we have a virus that doesn't form a plaque for some reason. Uh, and uh, so we have to do what's called an endpoint dilution where we again make dilutions of the virus as we did before, minus two, three, four, et cetera. And what we do here is we take 96 well plates. This is a plate, a plastic dish with 96 wells, and in each wells are growing cells. In each well are growing cells. And then you take the 10 to the minus 2 dilution of your virus, and you add uh, that to all the wells across this row. And then you take your 10 to the minus 3 dilution, and you add it to all the wells, and so forth, all the way down the line. And then you add your medium, and you incubate, and then after a few days, you look to, under the microscope at each cell, and at each well, or you can stain them and look for cytopathic effect, which would be an indication of, that the virus is reproducing. And so here is an example of how you can do that, and there is um, um, a plus whenever you see a cytopathic effect. So at the low dilutions, all the wells are infected. Each plus is for a separate well. And then you can see as we start to make higher and higher dilutions, now there are some wells that are not infected, right? Because you're adding less virus. So chances are that some will be uninfected. And then if you go all the way out to minus 7 dilution, none of the wells are infected because there's no, mo no more virus left. And what you do is you look for the dilution where half of the wells are infected. That would be this one, 10 to the minus 5. Uh, there's an equal number of pluses and minuses. And then you would say, the tissue culture infectious dose 50%, or TCID 50, is 10 to the fifth. 10 to the fifth, because that's a reflection of the dilution. And you can use this to compare different viruses. And companies often do this because you can adapt this to a high throughput uh, approach. Do a lot of assays in one day. It's harder to do that for a plaque assay. Now, usually the endpoint doesn't fall on a nice number like it did here. I just made this up. Usually it's between two, but then you can do st extrapolations using statistical procedures. All right. So that is uh, the end point. Now, the other issue we need to cover is that not all virus particles are infectious. Um, the, all the particles that come out of a cell, only a fraction of them are typically infectious, and we represent that by, why, by what we call the particle-to-PFU ratio where we take the number of infectious particles in a preparation, which we can determine, say, by plaque assay, and we take that and divide it into the number of physical particles. So this is a division um, action up here in the upper right. Number of physical particles divided by the number of infectious particles. Uh, physical particles is not easy to figure out. You, you might have to look at them under an electron microscope or count them in some other way. But the, here are some particle to PFU ratios for different viruses, and you can see they vary quite widely, right? So for some viruses, every particle that's produced is infectious. So the Sim leaky forest virus, the particle to PFU ratio is about one. That's great, but for some, it's 10,000. So only one in 10,000 papillomaviruses 
are infectious. And for poliovirus here, between 30 and 1,000 are, one in 30 and 1,000 are infectious. So it's very important to remember, cells make a lot of particles. Many of them are broken, they're mutated, and they simply won't infect. So the particle to PFU ratio, the number of physical particles divided by the number of infectious ones, uh, what this tells you, so we already know that a single particle can initiate infection, right? We have seen from the dose response curve that one particle can initiate infection. However, not all particles are successful at doing that. That's what the particle to PFU ratio tells us. And you, you can see in this picture of a poliovirus preparation taken by the electron microscope, a few of them are empty. They don't have a genome in them. And so that would certainly make them not infectious. So you can have damaged particles. Sometimes the genome has mutations that make it unable to infect. Or, But you have to remember the infectious cycle is a complicated series of events. And failure at any step, you don't finish. And you could fail for many reasons. You can have errors. You can have enzymes that don't work. These are some of the reasons for a high particle to PFU ratio. And um, yes, this can differ depending on how you grow the virus. Absolutely. You could, maybe it would differ in different cells. It could differ in animals versus cells. And for SARS-CoV-2, this has not really been studied as far as I know. It complicates the study of viruses because you don't know how many are infectious. All right, let's try another quiz. I'm sorry if you are having issues. Maybe you could log out and log back in again. Sometimes that will try it. But here, I'm going to go to the next question, which is in particle to PFU ratio. Particle can best be described as, all right, A, one of the proteins that makes up the virus, B, a virus which may or may not be infectious, C, a virus which is infectious, D, a virus which is not infectious, or E, elementary or composite. And while you're chewing on that, let's take a look at some of your questions. Yeah, so Eric says, less infectious because of mistakes in transcription. It could be, absolutely. Mistakes at just about any, any part. Do we know the particle of PFU of COVID? No, I don't believe that's been uh, sorted out. Nope. Hmm, why wouldn't evolution quickly select for low particle of PFU? It might not matter. And it may, you know, in a in a in the natural host, maybe it's close to one. I'm not sure that. People really do that. It's mostly done in cell culture. So it could either be that it doesn't matter and any infectivity is enough or that in animals it's very different from in cell culture. Does that ratio hold in any cell type? No, it's, as I said, it can vary according to cell type and even according to animal. Does CPE measurement correlate to pathogenicity? Uh, no, it doesn't. You, because CPE is measured in cells and culture and it may not be the right cell or however if you're using a relevant cell and, and the virus is destroying it, it it may correlate with pathogenicity for sure does the cell monolayer ever peel when the auger overlay is removed oh you bet it does and then we yell we get really mad um, so you have to be very careful that you uh, there's a trick to doing it and in fact uh, I have a video on the plaque assay, which is here at my YouTube channel. Oh, I should have put the link up. But I have a video which shows you exactly what happens in a plaque assay. It's, it's a video of Amy making a plaque assay. You should check it out. <laughs> you should really check it out. Does the infectious cycle include lysis versus lysogeny? Well, it, you know, when, when lysogeny occurs, that is when the genome integrates into the cell and the reproduction cycle stops, then it ends there. So it doesn't include that. But it, once you ac exit from lysogeny, then you would resume the infectious cycle. Uh, 
What is TCID? Tissue culture infectious doses. I don't know why uh, folks are having trouble with Socrative today. Maybe there are so many of you. I'll have to look into it. Yeah, we have 101, actually 158 logged in. It should be okay. I've had that in the past. Um, but, you know, with quitting the browser, there's still a cache, and that could be part of the problem. Maybe you could try a different browser, you know. Um, I'm sorry about that. We can look into it. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, most of you got uh, the right answer. A particle which may or may not be infectious. That's the answer. So a little bit of confusion here. One of the proteins that makes up the virus. No, that has nothing to do with the particle to PFU ratio, right? It's the ratio of non-infectious to infectious particles. So a particle, right? So we're talking about the particle to PFU ratio. The PFU is what is infectious. Particle could be either infectious or not infectious, right? It's everything. Total particles. So that's why B is right. A part a virus which is infectious, C, no, the infectious part is the PFU. That's on the bottom of the equation. And the others uh, you didn't you didn't uh, pick, which is good. I'm glad to see that. I forgot to bring Vinny in for that little discussion. Sorry about that. Let's get rid of the question. I learned that last time, right? So I can learn sometimes. All right. Now, what what do we do with all of this? Um, one thing we can do is study reproduction of the virus in cells. This is called the one-step growth cycle. It's a way to study how viruses reproduce in cells. First sorted out in 1939 uh, by Ellis and Delbruck. And that's a, that's a key year, remember? Uh, that's the year we decided that viruses were not liquid. And this is one of the experiments that showed that. We'll get back to that in a moment. So what you do here is you take a monolayer of cells, or in this case, uh, a culture of bacteria for phages. You add the virus uh, and let the virus absorb. And then you dilute the culture so you get no more adsorption. You dilute it so now the chance that a virus will find a cell is so low. And then you add medium and start sampling. And then you assay virus production. And so... This becomes a one step because you infect all the cells at once and then you start them off all together by, by the dilution step. So it's synchronous. And so what you can do is shown here. On the left is a single step growth curve where you've infected every cell in the culture. Uh, here these are uh, bacteriophages and bacteria. So we uh, infect this is the first experiment, the first growth curve that was done. Uh, you infect, uh, you add virus to your cells, then you dilute it, and you start taking time points. So now we have on the y-axis the number of infectious particles. We're looking at time. And what you see is for some period of time, which we call the eclipse period, we don't detect any new infectivity, you know, by your plaque assay. But then at some point we start to see the production of new infectious viruses, and that's called the burst or the yield, and eventually the cells either all die or become exhausted and you, you don't make any more virus. So here we've infected all the cells in the culture, so they're all synchronously making virus. They're all synchronously going through this growth uh, curve with the eclipse, the burst, and then the plateau period. You can also infect fewer, virus, uh, fewer cells by simply diluting the virus. And so what, what happens here, you then do your infection, you start measuring infectivity over time. You still have an eclipse period, and then you have your burst, but you have the first burst, and that's only the first cells that were infected. There are a lot of uninfected cells, and they will become infected after that first virus comes out, and you will get a second burst, and a third, and a fourth, depending on how you have diluted it. So the advantage of this growth curve is you can look at what's happening in all the cells at one time. You can look at different events, so all the next lectures that we're going to talk about, about virus attachment and reproduction, RNA synthesis, DNA synthesis. It's all done in a one-step growth curve. Now, on the right, if you have a mutant that you think has a defect, sometimes it's only evident after multiple cycles of infection. We can do this, of course, with viruses that infect animal cells. Here's a, an example with adenovirus, where we have infected cells uh, in the same way, and then add an overlay. And you can see there's an eclipse period. In this case, it's about 12 hours long. 
Uh, and then you start to see uh, virus produced in the medium. There's a, a logarithmic increase, and then it plateaus as the cells die. Now, what you can also do is distinguish between virus in the cell, intracellular virus, and the virus released from the cell, what we call extracellular. And you can do that simply by taking the medium off the cells and uh, doing a plaque assay. And you can see that viruses are made first in the cell, and they don't get out of the cell, in this case, until about uh, between 16 and 20 hours. And that defines the latent period, the period before you see viruses outside of the cells. Uh, and then the extracellular virus begins to increase as well. Now, both of these experiments show that there's an eclipse period where the parts are made, the virus infects the cell, the parts are made and assemble into new particles. And that's why we don't have infectivity until some time after uh, virus reproduction has begun. And that was the key to showing that viruses were not simply small bacteria. Uh, and, of course, the electron microscope showing that um, um, they were particulate. Remember, bacteria reproduce differently. There's much less of a lag, which is there for a different reason. The lag that you see when you put a single bacterium into a broth is it's ramping up its metabolism, and then it starts to divide first into two, then four and eight. So this is binary fission, very different from what viruses do. Viruses go in the cell, and they make um, the parts, and then they assemble new ones. So someone is asking, what is the difference between the red uh, and the purple lines in this graph? That's a good question. So the, the purple are the total viruses that are produced, and the red is just the intracellular, and the orange is the extracellular. So most the intracellular is the vast majority of viruses that are produced. That's why it's so close to the total uh, curve. So the I've told you a way to synchronize infection. That is, you infect all the cells, and so you can see every cell infected, and so all the events are happening at the same time. So that's the key to the one-step growth cycle. How do you know, though, uh, when you infect all the cells? And that's really important. And so let's talk a little bit about that. That depends on the multiplicity of infection, or MOI. The MOI is the number of infectious particles added per cell. Okay? So you, you simply I say, I've added X number of PFU. You could divide it by the number of cells in your plate. That will give you the MOI. It's what you add. That's why added here is in caps. It is not the number of infectious particles received by each cell. It's what you add. And so if you add 10 to the 7th virus particles to a million cells, that gives you an MOI of 10. Each cell does not get 10 virus particles. This is just what you have added. And why that is, uh, I'll tell you in a moment. There were a couple of questions here I wanted to address. Um, how do you determine the time points to make sure it's not just a single burst? Well, you, you, typically for your virus, you, you know the kinetics and you're, you're familiar with uh, how long it's going to take and how to space it out. But... Uh, if you've infected every cell, you would just keep taking time points until you don't see any more virus production. You'd see that plateau at the end, and that would be the key, right? Yeah, mentioning the 2020 uh, lectures were happening while the uh, pandemic emerged, and I would start with some piece of breaking news on that. Yep, that was a lot of fun to do that. Yep. Is the eclipse period or the latent period the same as the incubation for SARS-CoV-2? No, it's quite different. I think this was asked last time also. The incubation period is the period before symptoms are evident, and that's a very different uh, occurrence here. Viruses that have proofreading in their genome can have a lower particle to PFU ratio. It might, you could, in fact, uh, that's been done for some viruses, you knock out the proofreading function, and then you get a higher particle to PFU ratio. It's not going to completely restore it, right? But yes, that's part of it, absolutely. 
How does one determine the starting concentration? I don't know. I'm not quite sure what you mean. The starting, how much you add to a cell. Well, if you want, as you'll see in a moment now, we, we're going to talk about how much you would add to a cell. All right, so let's go back to this. The MOI is 10, but that doesn't tell you how much each cell gets. Each cell doesn't get 10 particles. No, because it's a distribution. Because infection of cells with viruses depends on random collisions of viruses and cells. You mix cells with a virus, some cells get uninfected, some get one particle, some get two, some get three, some get more. It's a random event. And you think about tennis balls. You take a box of tennis balls, you throw them at buckets. Not every bucket is going to get the same number of balls, right? Same thing with adding viruses to cells. And so the number of viruses each cell gets is best described by a statistical formula called the Poisson distribution, which is shown here. This is a graph of it. It's a discrete function. So it tells you uh, with the number of added viruses how many cells will get one or two or more and how many will get none. And this is the formula that we use to determine it. Don't be, don't be uh, turned off or scared by it. It's quite simple. I'm going to simplify it for you. So PK in this formula is the fraction of cells infected by K virus particles. Okay, that's PK. So K is uh, K, K, how many viruses are infecting each cell. M is the multiplicity of infection in that formula. And E, of course, is the natural logarithm. So those are the only three variables you have in that formula. And so actually we can, we can simplify it to make your life easier. Uninfected cells. So you can, I can tell you the number of uninfected cells in a culture simply by taking the, net, the E and, and raising it to minus MOI. So E to the minus MOI gives you the number of uninfected cells in a culture. The cells that get one particle is M times E to the minus M, where M is, again, the multiplicity. And then multiply infected cells, anything greater than one, is this formula, 1 minus e to the minus m times m minus 1. And this is basically subtracting from 1 the sum of all probabilities of any value of k, that's p0 and p1. So we're basically subtracting from 1 p0 and p1, and that gives us cells multiply infected. All right, so that is not hard. Um, let's, let's illustrate it with some examples. So if you have a million cells in a dish and you infect at an MOI of 10. That means you add 10 to the seventh P if you have virus. You use that formula, 45 cells will be uninfected. So most of the cells are infected in those million cells, right? 450 cells get one particle and the rest, the vast majority get more than one virus. So every cell is infected. You're going to get a one-step growth curve at an MOI of 10. If you do an MOI of one, 37% of the cells are uninfected, 37% get one particle, and 26% get more than one. So about a third of the, of the culture is going to be infected, and you're going to get multiple growth curves. And finally, if you use 0.001 MOI, most of the cells are uninfected, 99.9%. Very few receive one particle. 990 cells get one, and very few get more than one. So this is barely infected, and so you're going to have many, many growth steps in this culture, but it will be infected. So that's the multiplicity of infection. That's what it means, and um, that's how to tell when your cells are all infected. If you want to do a one-step curve, you do an MOI of 5 to 10, basically. All right, let's try Socrative again. Sorry for the problems. Um, let's do the last question here. Mm, now it's not even letting me go. Interesting. Huh. Curious. So let's, um, Never had a problem with Socrative. I'm going to launch a new version of that, folks. I'm going to say, yes, we're going to launch a new version. Choose quiz. My folder is empty. Maybe because I'm not signed in. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. 
I'm going to sign out and sign in again. Yes, I do. Now we will sign in. And um, well, there seems to be a current activity. <laughs> All right, there we are. Infectious cycle. So teacher paste, no names, and show final score. Okay. Yeah, Socrative is funky today. Never did this before. All right, that's one which we're going to skip, and it doesn't really like. Um, all right, there's two. Okay, there's three, and now let's go to four. Ahem. There we go. <laughs> okay, if cells are infected at an MOI of 10 in a one-step growth cycle, in the growth curve, you will likely see a multiple bursts of virus release. Let's get Vinny in there. Multiple eclipse periods, a single burst of virus release, no burst of virus relief, or asynchronous infection. Okay. Uh, by the way, these classes run about two hours, and they're all recorded on YouTube. You can always go back and see them later, including the chat, so you get all the questions. Hmm. How does calculating the number of infected cells help us in real life in pandemic times? Uh, this is a research course. This is all about how to study viruses. And if we study them, we make antivirals and vaccines. So it ends up helping you. And I'm explaining to you today the methods that we use to study viruses, because otherwise you wouldn't know that. You lost me at PK. Uh, sorry, just go back and, and re-listen. It's is PK is the fraction of cells infected with K viruses, right? So if you add a, an MOI, a certain MOI, you can use the formula to figure out how many cells got so many viruses. And, and I gave you three examples of that. So it looks like people are able to um, access the quiz. Here's an interesting question. Is it possible to run a plaque assay for AAV since you'd need to infect with AD5? Yes, you could. Uh, you can um, just do a high MOI of both viruses, right? And then the likelihood that they will infect the same cell is quite high. You can do an MOI of 10. That'll do it. Looks like people are on and answering. I'm going to give you a little more time to answer. What experiments are performed to calculate intracellular and extracellular virus numbers? So it's very simple. You have a plate of cells, right, infected. The cells are sticking to the plastic. On top is liquid. You take a little bit of the liquid off, and you can measure the virus in the supernatant, right, what's released from the cells. And then you can take, you could scrape the cells off and break them open and measure what's in them. Of course, if you do that, then you have to make sure you have duplicates of each plate because you're going to get rid of one at each time point, right? Yes, PK is the probability that exactly that, no, that PK is the probability uh, that cells are infected with K viruses. Let's take a look at this quiz now. We are done. Show results. Most of you got C, which is the right answer. So in this MOI, you're going to have a single burst because it's a high MOI, 10. All the cells are infected, and you're going to get one round of reproduction. Multiple bursts, no, because you only get multiple when you have a low MOI. I showed you one or lower. Multiple eclipses, no. No bursts, no, you're going to get infection because you have an MOI of 10. Asynchronous, no, an MOI of 10 gives you synchronous uh, virus infection. So let me show you that. 
We'll go back to the slide. And MOI of 10, most of the cells get more than one particle, right? So you're going to get one growth curve. When every cell is infected, you get one growth curve. When every cell is not infected, like at MOI of 1, where you have 37% of the cells uninfected, then you're going to have more than one growth cycle. So that's why that is one growth cycle. I want to move to some physical measurements of virus particles. Uh, there are many ways you can physically measure virus particles. You can use uh, hemagglutination. It's an assay where we can use red blood cells to ask, is there any virus there? It's only used for certain kinds of viruses. We can take pictures of the virus by electron microscopy. We can measure enzymes in the virus particle. Or we can use what we call serology, the uh, immune response, to uh, measure particles. We can measure either antibodies to viruses or their proteins. And, uh, of course, we can also use nucleic acid-based methods. Looks like nucleic acids got cut off yet from this slide. So let's, let's reduce the text so you can see it. There we go. <laughs> nucleic acids like PCR or sequencing. So let's go through some of these. Hemagglutination is done mostly with uh, influenza viruses as a quick way of knowing whether you've got some virus present. It's based on the idea that the virus receptor is present on the surface of red blood cells. Now, red blood cells do not support influenza virus infection. They are, so this is a good question. Are influenza viruses susceptible Yes, because they have a receptor. Are they permissive? No, they are not permissive for infection. So what you do is you add virus to red blood cells, and if there is virus present, it will stick to the red blood cells, and then the red blood cells will stick to each other in turn because you're going to have multiple cross-linking, and they will form a sheet. Whereas if there's no influenza virus, they will not stick to each other. And so what you do is you do the assay in these V-bottomed well, v -bottomed wells. These are 96 well plates, and the, they have a point in the middle. And so if you just add red blood cells to these wells, the red blood cells will tumble to the bottom of the well and make a little button. So here, for example, and, and what you can do is make dilutions, twofold dilutions in this case of your virus or what you think is virus, to, to identify the endpoint. So you can see sample C has no virus in it because the, the, well, everything is forming a button of red blood cells even at a very low dilution. But sample D does have virus. You see we're getting these um, sheets of red blood cells forming. No buttons until 1 to 1,024 dilution. So now we've diluted out the virus so it's no longer cross-linking the red blood cells. So the, we would say the hemagglutination or HA titer of this preparation of influenza virus is 512. And this is a very important assay for measuring antibodies to the hemagglutinin, which is done quite frequently. We can measure enzyme activity. So here, for example, is a retrovirus, which we will talk about a lot later on. Retroviruses have an enzyme in the particle, in the virus particle, called reverse transcriptase, or RT, and you can easily assay for this enzyme. It's not an infectivity assay, just like hemagglutination is not, but it's a way of knowing whether potentially infectious viruses are, are present. And in this case, you can simply take the, the medium of, say, infected cells and put them on a filter, and we've, we've made a radioactive assay for reverse transcriptase, we've added a precursor, a nucleotide precursor, we've added a substrate, and we simply ask, is there an activity that makes DNA from RNA? And these are cell cultures that are either mock infected at different days after infection or infected with a virus at two different dilutions. And you can see that you see reverse transcriptase activity uh, in these supernatants, which suggests the presence of infectious particles. Uh, Antibody-based assays are very important in, in virology, and we're going to be using and talking about these a lot here, for sure. 
the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA, is a way to detect either antigens or antibodies. And, of course, you've all been hearing about uh, antigen and antibody tests for SARS-CoV-2, and this is how they work. Let's say you want to detect antigens. You want to take a nasopharyngeal swab and ask, is there any viral protein present? And so what you do is you take a plastic support and you add to it uh, what we call a capture antibody. This is an antibody to the protein you're interested in. If this is SARS-CoV-2, this could be the N protein. And then you pass over this antibody plastic uh, construct your sample, your nasopharyngeal swab. If there are proteins in it, if there are viral proteins, they'll be captured by the antibody. And then you use a second antibody to the protein, which is labeled with an indicator that you can visually measure. You can see it or you can measure it in some way, fluorescence or color. And then you can measure the presence of your antigen. So you're actually doing this on plastic to immobilize it and give you a good readout. You can also look for antibodies. In this case, you would stick the viral protein on the plastic. You would then, say, add serum from someone who you would think might be infected. If there are antibodies in the serum to the viral protein, they will bind the protein. And then you can detect those antibodies by a second antibody. And that second antibody will have some kind of label on it as well that you can see. This uh, has, was used to further identify a coronavirus in those samples that we talked about earlier. This is the same preprint uh, where, um, the, or perhaps a different one, actually, I don't recall. Um, but basically, they, they took um, uh, a virus. Uh, this, is, this is the number four isolate of uh, what turned out to be SARS-CoV-2. Remember, they infected viral cells. They saw cytopathic effects. And then they took those cells and they stained them with an antibody to the viral nuclear protein. And this is a coronavirus NP antibody, which will cross-react with different coronaviruses. So to stain the cells, you would fix them on, on the cell culture dish or on the slide. Typically, you use, say, methanol to permeabilize them so the antibodies will get in. And then you add your antibodies. In this case, we're adding antibodies to the nuclear protein. And then we add a second antibody, which fluoresces red under UV light. And you can see these infected cells, which are displaying CPE, right? We've got holes in the monolayer. They're also making nuclear protein. So a nice way of showing uh, what's going on in cells is there viral protein present in those cells developing CPE. So the ELISA is uh, the basis for lateral flow assays which can be used for many things. They're used for rapid pregnancy tests. They can be used to de uh, detect uh, viral antibodies or antigens. And so uh, here we're looking, we've made a lateral flow test looking for viral proteins in a clinical sample. And so you can put a nasopharyngeal wash here. The, the lateral flow assay is basically a, uh, an absorbent pad in which uh, the, the materials you put on one end will, will simply flow towards the other end by being pulled through the absorbent material it's by capillary flow. And the pad has a number of reagents put on it. Here at the very left end, uh, we have antibodies to whatever antigen you're looking for. And those an antibodies are conjugated to colloidal gold, which will allow us to actually see them in the lateral flow assay. So you're a sample is put at one end. It moves past these antibodies. The antibodies will pick up the antigen. They will flow down. And you can see the antibodies here conjugated to our protein, which is in red. And then they will reach this first line, uh, which is the test result. And these are antibodies to the antigen also that are stuck on the, the pad. And so any uh, antigen that's moved down will be picked up by those antibodies as shown in the bottom. And you can then see a, a black line on the cartridge because the gold particles will make the, the black line as those antibodies are binding the antigen. So it's kind of a sandwich, right? The antigen is binding the antibodies stuck onto the lateral flow pad. And then the second uh, antibody to the antigen has the gold on it. And that's how you see the line. 
Uh, then there's a control line which validates the test. Uh, and here, these are antibodies stuck on the test pad to the antibody that was present at the, at the left end. And th these uh, antibodies will capture those antibodies. And uh, those antibodies, of course, are conjugated to colloidal gold. So whether or not they have an antigen, uh, those antibodies will bind here and say, ah, the test worked. You know, the, the liquid got all the way to here, and the antibodies are all working. So you always have two lines. You have a test line uh, and a control line. And so this is designed for picking up antigens. You can also design it to pick up antibodies, in which case you would put uh, antigen here on the left end. And one of the ways we detect signals in, in many of these tests is by using uh, a protein called green fluorescent protein, uh, originally discovered in jellyfish. You know, the reason jellyfish uh, at night, if you, if you move something in the water off the coast, you will see fluorescence. They have fluorescent proteins of all sorts in them, and green fluorescent protein was discovered first. And the Nobel Prize years ago was actually given to a people for discovering it and for using it in biology. We can incorporate green fluorescent protein into viral genomes uh, to help us do research. So for here, for example, on the left is a photograph of a cell infected with uh, HIV, and HIV is labeled with green fluorescent protein. And this is actually a light micrograph, which is visible because the fluorescent light is now very big. It makes a big dot on the on the micrograph and you can visualize the particle and actually these are HIV particles moving along microtubules in the cell. So we can see virus particles by virtue of giving them uh, visible light. We can also use different colors of fluorescent protein. So the green can be modified to be different colors. Here you can see a whole variety of different colors uh, in cells infected with a herpes virus. You can make green and red and cyan and orange and so forth really, really amazing versatility. The other, uh, the other set of uh, assays that I want to talk about are based on nucleic acids. And nowadays, you must hear about deep, high-throughput sequencing where you can get viral genomes done in no time. This allows you to sequence everything in water or dirt or your respiratory tract, for example. You can identify new viruses in samples. You can identify new pathogens. And just to give you an idea of how this has brought down the cost, the human genome, the first human genome, took 10 years to sequence at a cost of $3 billion. And today we can do the same in one day for about $1,000, and the price is always dropping. So new technologies were developed that we don't have time to go into uh, that are amazing in their technical virtuosity. This by contrast, is not deep high-throughput sequencing. This is how I used to sequence genomes, by running samples on gels and manually reading them. It took me one year to sequence the genome of poliovirus by doing this, whereas nowadays that could be done uh, in no time. So this has obviously contributed extensively to the pandemic because we have millions and millions of full-length genomes from isolates from different patients. And when we have those sequences, we can build what we call phylogenetic trees. Now, uh, here we have 10 different viruses, perhaps which we have isolated from, from different patients. And we have sequences for each of them, and we want to know how they're related. So what we do is we take computer programs that will com pairwise compare all of these sequences and make a phylogenetic tree, which is what the name of this is, and, and order them according to what pairs are most similar, or, or more than pairs, if you will. So these trees measure the genetic distance between organisms. They measure and they identify nearest relatives. Uh, the way you, you look at this, here, here are our viruses here on the right in red. So we actually have those, those uh, nucleic acids. Uh, and then to the left, uh, we build nodes the common ancestor to, of the virus to the right. So for virus 1 and 2, they share a common ancestor, uh, as does virus 3 and 4, which is also shared with 1 and 2. So the common ancestor. 
And so the idea is we may not even have these ancestors. We only have the samples at the right, but we can order these according to their relationships, and we can measure uh, the degree of genetic change in these phylogenetic trees. They change from left to right. We have uh, the degree of genetic change, and usually there's a scale given to you, uh, the number of changes per length uh, of the sequence here. And so, you know, pairs of viruses are, are more closely related here. Virus 1 and 2 are the most closely related. They are related to 3 and 4, uh, and less so to viruses 9 and 10. And sometimes these trees are what we call rooted. Here is the blue, is the presumed ancestor of all these viruses. And again, rarely we have these roots. Uh, we typically have the tips of the branches here on the right, which are the viruses whose similarity we're trying to remember, to measure. And as we'll see multiple times through this course, uh, we can use this to uh, compare viruses. And that was done when the genome sequence of that first virus was uh, identified. The very first virus shown earlier in this, in this lecture, in this session, where I showed you how they isolated it from bronchoalveolar wash, uh, showed CPE on cells. They then did the genome sequence, and they made a phylogenetic tree comparing those isolates, shown here in red, with other known coronaviruses. And from that, they saw, well, it's a beta coronavirus because all these other uh, bat SARS-like coronaviruses are, are beta coronaviruses, and they're not alpha coronaviruses, which are more distant. They all share a common ancestor, but then they diversify from left to right uh, over time. Uh, and here were some common cold, human common cold uh, coronaviruses, uh, which were added. And you can see SARS-CoV-2 was quite distant from that. So we'll use this kind of analysis multiple times in this course to compare uh, different viruses. Polymerase chain reaction is another kind of assay for looking for nucleic acids. Uh, this has wide use in research industry, in diagnosis, P an incredible development which started in the 1960s when Tom Brock, a, a microbiologist in Wisconsin, isolated bacteria from hot springs. And in particular, he isolated Thermus aquaticus, wanted to understand how it could grow at these high temperatures. Subsequently, the DNA polymerase from that bacterium was used to develop the PCR assay. And the way the assay works is you have, you're looking for a DNA sequence. So you synthesize short DNA primers that are complementary. You then mix it all together with nucleotides and you use a DNA polymerase that is thermostable because we're going to go through multiple cycles of heating and cooling. You denature the DNA to get the single strands. The oligonucleotides will anneal, and then and the denaturing is done at near 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, you anneal the oligos, and then you use your polymerase to make a double-stranded product. So now you have two DNAs where you had before just one, and then you repeat the cycles. Each is a cycle. Now you have four DNAs, and you have eight and 16. And you start with DNA. If you wanted to start with RNA, you would have to turn the RNA into DNA first using reverse transcriptase, and that's why we call that RT-PCR. And this, of course, has been used extensively throughout the pandemic, but I want to remind you that PCR product is not the same as infectious virus. I began to ring this bell back in the Zika virus uh, epidemic. This paper was published out of the CDC. They were doing experiments uh, in mice to look at sexual transmission of Zika virus. So they would infect male mice with Zika virus and then um, look at virus shedding in seminal fluids. And this graph tells the whole story. So if you measure infectious virus, say by a plaque assay, you see these infected mice begin to shed uh, virus in the seminal fluid. Uh, you know, after a few days, they peak at about 12 days. And then by 21 days, there is no longer any infectious virus in the seminal fluid. However, if you measure viral RNA by PCR, RT-PCR, you see that there is a positive signal well beyond the stage at which you have infectivity. PCR product is not the same as infectious virus. We now understand for many RNA viruses, RNA can be detected very long after disappearance of infectious virus. 
we know this for SARS-CoV-2 as well. And in fact, here is a graph that sort of compares PCR detection of SARS-CoV-2 and infectivity. There are not a lot of these out there, but this is one of them. So we have a quantity of, of RNA on the y-axis there. And then on the x-axis, uh, we have days after infection. And so the blue um, curve there, and I've lost my pointer, otherwise I'd be pointing it out to you. The blue curve uh, is the time when you see infectious SARS-CoV-2. This is from uh, a patient. So infectivity beginning at about two days in this uh, e example, peaking at around six days, and then after nine days, no more infectivity detectable in that patient. Yet, by RT-PCR, you can still detect infectivity up to 22 days after infection. You can still detect PCR product up to 22 days after you have no more infectious virus present. And so this obviously has implications for what a PCR positivity means, and we've now realized that we have to look at the cycle threshold. How many cycles does the PCR have to go through to detect the genome? So on the left is a relationship between the number of cycles and fluorescence. So the PCR readout now is fluorescence. You, you incorporate fluorescent nucleotides. And with each cycle, you have more and more fluorescence until you go above a threshold that is your background. And then you're actually measuring the product. And so the CT value is that point where you go above the threshold and then you can increase, you can keep doing cycles after that and you get uh, uh, more and more detection, but the, what's the relationship between cycle threshold and infectivity? Well, it's harder to come by, but on the right is a study that was done with uh, a number of patients. I want to get my pointer back here. There we go. So fluorescence increases above a threshold, and with each cycle it gets higher and higher, and eventually will will plateau depending on the amount of nucleic acid, and the number of cycles depends on how much nucleic acid is present. So that first detection, where you first go over the threshold, if you have a lot of nucleic acid, you don't need a lot of cycles to get there. If you have very little nucleic acid, you need a lot of cycles. And so here is a relationship between cycle threshold and the probability that a sample from a patient is going to be culture positive, which means infectivity. And so here we have cycle thresholds going from about 25 uh, down to less than 20. Uh, and so you see that I infectivity positive, those are the red bars here, correlates with low uh, cycle thresholds. And then we don't have a good chance of infectivity when the cycle threshold value uh, increases. So the higher the number, and probably above 30 or so, 32, you're very unlikely to have uh, infectious virus present. So I had an interesting experience with uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the beginning of 2020. I have two videos here on YouTube you might want to check out. So I first tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, but my cycle threshold was 35. And so to me, that was most likely a, a false positive, and a subsequent test showed that was the case. Uh, and to prove it, I did a at-home SARS-CoV-2 antibody test, a lateral flow assay like the one I was just telling you, and that confirmed that, um, in fact, I had no antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. So two actually teaching moments, if you will, uh, resulting from this. That does it for today. I'm going to answer a few questions before we leave, but uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday, next time, we're going to talk about genomes uh, and genetics. All right, let's uh, do a couple of questions here. Let us see. What is denaturing? Why is it needed? So denaturing simply means you take a double-stranded DNA and you heat it till the strands come apart. And then you can add your PCR primers and start the amplification. If it's double-stranded, you cannot do the PCR, right? A lot of questions about, <laughs> I like this one. Pay attention. PCR cycling is coming up. 
Has phylogenetic analysis changed classification of viruses? Yes, absolutely. Nowadays, that's all we use for classification. We no longer use properties of the virus, host range, what kind of disease it causes. We just look at the sequence, we put it on a tree and say, ah, that's a beta coronavirus. Totally has revolutionized it, for sure. If the control in a lateral flow, if the control line is good, could the test be defective? Unlikely. That means everything has worked, right? Your antibodies are there; they're reacting properly. So, uh, unlikely. But you know, the Binax Now tests, for example, the uh, antigen tests, the lateral flow, they always say do it twice. If you're negative, then do it again in a few days, just to be sure. Yeah. When detecting antibodies, the part that lights up the same for different tests. Yes, so they use an antibody to the constant part of the antibody, the FC portion typically. Absolutely. If the capture antibody were positive, it were fluorescent, it would be positive before you put in. Yeah, the capture antibody is not giving a signal. I guess that's in response to someone who, who asked the question about that. What do I think was the cause of my false positive? Well, false positive can happen in a number of off-target priming by the primers. Something else in my nose uh, reacted with the primers, er user error. Or um, it could be that we were working with plasmids in the lab, and I went through the lab and inhaled a bit of that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 plasmids. I don't know. Can, um, can we go through the answers to the study questions at some time? Oh, I could do I could do that, or I could go or I put the answers up if you'd like. You let me know what you'd prefer. Um, we could have. We could have. That's sorry. Yeah, someone said I have bed head. I don't actually. I took a shower this morning, but my hair is too long. Um, <laughs> let me know how you want to do the study questions. By the way, thanks all the mods for. Uh, <clears throat> For being here, I've seen today uh, Vanity Nutrition. I, don't, I didn't see Frank. I saw Mr. Ozzy Cam, Steph SF, Last Fabi, Firuza. I didn't see, but all those people have signed up. And I know it's hard, folks. But um, go if you have trouble, go back and listen. And um, you could bring questions next. So maybe I need to have uh, office hours, right? <laughs> go over the. Study questions, go over the um, any other questions you might have. That would be fine with me. Oh, thank you for your contribution. I really appreciate it, Marge716. Thanks all the moderators. I, th I believe I did thank them. I, I can post and explain if you'd like. That's fine with me. No problem. Yeah, someone said, I like the bed head look. Well, my hair was sticking up before. It's just because it was outside. It's windy out here in New York. <laughs> but as I said, I'm getting a haircut tomorrow because someone asked me before, should I... Uh, I, I need to get a haircut because the image is closer, right? You said fix it. I fixed it. You said fix the contrast. The contrast is better, right? You could see the white wall. You could see my blue shirt. Skin colors are good. I try and respond, folks. Does anyone know how you can isolate a virus? Well, I think you should go back to the beginning of this because we talked about it. And, yes, you try different cell cultures for sure because they may not work depending on what you're looking for. And, you know, all the giant viruses are grown in amoeba because that's what works. It's not clear that those are the natural hosts for those giant viruses. <laughs> Get a haircut. <laughs> Thank you, James, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. And um, I have a few more minutes here. 
We can have questions. Um, uh, do you think 1890 was caused by OC34? Good question. We should talk about that sometime. Go over the data. Is Amy available for tutoring? Well, you know, the other night in the live stream, I said she couldn't do it, but then she told me later. I didn't say no, so come on the live stream and say, please do a recitation. It would be awesome to have a, an Amy recitation, right? Just her. I'd, I would not participate. That would be fun. So I'm going to, uh, the smallest virus, by the way, is, we're going to talk about that next time, okay? Stay tuned, Wednesday. Um, I will post quiz questions. Oh, speaking of quiz questions, so so they're the quiz questions during the lecture, right? Which I give the answers, and you can see that recorded. Then there are weekly quizzes. Last week's has been posted. You have to go to the course uh, website, you know, virology.ws slash virology live 2021 and those uh, I, I will post those answers as well and then the study questions if you want I can post those as well but don't forget to go try out the quiz it's just a survey monkey type thing pretty easy to do and yeah I think don't they give you the answer I think they do they tell you what's wrong are there any ways to measure infectivity using PCR no I don't by that. You could measure mRNA, which suggests that there is reproduction, right? I would tell you if there's an mRNA, yeah, there has to be some reproduction, but you can't quantify infectivity by measuring mRNA, no. I mean, make a rapid infectivity test. That would be really good, but I don't know any way to do it. Thank you very much for your contribution. Really appreciate it, and thank you for your contribution. Can I explain a little more about the invention of PCR? Well, we don't have time today for to do that, but there are plenty of, uh, of, of videos on YouTube about that. If you actually, go to um, go to those videos that I referenced earlier and explain it a little more. Not the invention so much. Where are my blue glasses? They're at home. That's where I, I use those for the live stream. <laughs> I um. I, these are the ones I wear all the time, and it's okay. It works. So uh, the, uh, if I brought the blue glasses here, I wouldn't have them for at home. Full Robert Plant. I really like Robert Plant. One of my one of my favorite musicians. Uh, yeah, just ask Amy on Wednesday live stream, 8 p.m. Eastern, and say, "Can you do a recitation?" and um, Let's see what she said. How is the virus genome replicated? Well, we're going to talk about that in quite detail, so stay tuned. Does, does No, it doesn't come in Braille form. I'm sorry. Yes, I have the Pete Townsend look, although it's a little long now, right? <laughs> Lateral flow infectivity. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? But no, there is not. But if you invented it, you'd be quite famous. And I would have you on TWIV to talk about it for sure. Uh, there's no PhD at the end of the course, but you're going to know a lot. And plus, you can ask me any questions you want. <laughs> Thank you for your hard work. You found me on Lex Friedman. I got vaccinated after being informed. That's great. That's probably the best thing that I can do next to uh, teaching you guys, right? Any professor with immaculate hair is not to be trusted. Yeah. Okay. I'll mess mine up. How's that? Ah! Um, I haven't watched House, but many other people have. And Dixon has, and he talks about House a lot. And that, you know, this week in neuroscience, last episode, the title of the episode was It's Never Lupus, and that comes from House. All right, folks, I'm going to let you go. Um, thanks for being here. Be safe. Next time is Wednesday. 
October 6th, 11 a.m. Eastern. Take care.